Good morning. morning. Jesus said that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. To all of you here seeking the nourishment and today the warmth and the shelter of that word, welcome. Uh, We're glad you're with us today, whether in person or joining online uh, by way of the recording. Uh, My name is Patty, helping to lead worship today, and our guest preacher um, back with us once again is Reverend Tim Dalton. Thank you for joining us today. Please join me in the call to worship that is printed in your bulletin to be read responsibly. Gracious God, You are our way in the wilderness. In our own times of struggle, be our spiritual nourishment, protect us with your angels, and reveal your authority in our lives, so that we may hunger for righteousness and live in peace with our neighbors, worshiping and serving you alone, through Christ Jesus our Lord. And now please rise as you are able, join in singing our opening hymn number 165, The Glory of These Forty Days. Remember that our Lord Jesus can sympathize with us in our weakness, since in every respect he was as tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with the boldness approach the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Please join in the prayer of confession. It's printed in your bulletin, will be read in unison, followed by a brief time of silent prayer. Let us pray. Forgive us, Lord, for our apathy, for our lack of courage to speak out. Forgive us when we walk past and don't offer to help. 
Forgive us when we get it wrong. We confess that we are afraid. We don't want to overcome our hidden doubts and prejudices in order to be alongside those who are different from ourselves. We ask that you would lead us into action. Give us strength to be a voice crying for justice and peace. Help us to step into another person's shoes, or if they have no shoes, then not to be afraid to take off our own, peel off our preconceptions and assumptions, and curl, spread out our toes, and tread in their footprints. May we be a liberating presence and offer love, compassion, and whatever is needed to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Hear these words of assurance. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. And since God loves and welcomes us, we ought also to love and welcome one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Take the, this moment to turn to your neighbors and share the peace of Christ.
nobody really uses globes for your map, right? You don't even use maps for your map, right? You use your cell phones. But uh, cell phones are not quite the great illustration as a globe is, so I'm, I'm going to stick with the uh, globe. So I just want to give you a little hint of where we're going. Um, let me find it here. Where are you? There you are. Okay. So, what I'm going to read to you a little later is found in Luke 9. And it says that Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. And in Luke 9, he says this towards the end of Luke 9, and he travels for the next Ten chapters, he travels, he works his way. He doesn't go as the crow flies, he kind of zigzags, but he works his way to Jerusalem, where he is, of course, tried, convicted, and executed by the Roman Empire. And then, of course, we celebrate his resurrection. But I want to take us on this journey as it's found in the Gospel of Luke this week. I want to take, uh, not this week, well this week, yes, but for the next five weeks. And then as we approach uh, the, uh, the Palm Sunday and Easter, also take texts from Luke. So that's your Lenten challenge. Read ahead. Get ahead. It's only 10 chapters. Luke 9 to 19. Look at that this week. Maybe jot down some questions you have. Maybe there's something that strikes you as odd. It probably, it probably is odd. It's probably, if it strikes you as odd, it's probably not just you. It's, it's odd to, right? So come up with some questions as we continue, as we journey from uh, from Galilee to Jerusalem over the next Lenten season. Lent is a 40-day period, minus Sundays, that leads us right into Good Friday. And so this is a time, many times people say, you know, you give up chocolate, or you, you know, you, you do something, or give something else up. Uh, whatever it is for you. But maybe it's also not just giving something up, maybe it's also putting something on. I would, I would offer to you, caring for yourself is a Lenten practice. How today am I going to care for myself, right? That's adding something. So we're going to journey with Jesus this coming Lent, together through the Gospel of Luke. So join me for the journey. So it's not just today. Come back. Tell your friends. We're on a journey together, okay? Let us pray the prayer of illumination. Oh, Holy God, I just thank you for this time to uh, gather together. We thank you for this morning. In the warmth of this place, we just pray that the songs will touch our hearts, that the words will inspire us and encourage us in difficult times. We hold to your word, we hold to your Son, Jesus Christ, who will teach us how to journey with him. And so, God, I just pray for in the next few moments that we will have uh, just a, a wonderful experience of Christ's risen Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, my friends. For our psalm response, uh, the, the congregation is invited to join in on the refrain. It's in the hymnal number 89. The choir will sing it through first for, uh, to, for us to get to know it.
All right, we have two scriptures. I'm going to read the psalm first, Psalm 25, 1 through 10. Psalm 25, 1 through 10. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be uh, do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantingly treacherous. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. And also our gospel lesson for today, as I shared, will be in Luke, and it kind of starts us off here in Luke 9, verses 51 through 62. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him on their way Uh, they entered a village of Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then he went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, First, let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Hmm. Here ends the reading of the word. Thanks be to God. Welcome this morning, everyone. Uh, If you are uh, the normal, usual folks, uh, you probably know me. If you're a visitor this morning, You are very welcome to be here at the White Plains Presbyterian Church on this, the first Sunday of Lent. Lent commemorates the passage of 40 intentional days of reflection on our mortality, on this mortal reality. From dust we come and to the dust we will return. And it it ends at Holy Week, And then we take the word Lent from uh, the old English word, la ente, which means the lengthening of days. So it's this kind of approach of spring that we also acknowledge. But this 40 days, an intentional 40 days, we remember, of course, the 40 the 40 years of wilderness wandering of the Israelites, we we recall that Jesus also enacting this of 40 days of fasting in the wilderness to prepare himself for his ministry. 
And so now I have the distinct pleasure, uh, privilege, and honor to walk with you through Lent and Holy Week this year as we have a time together and as we look at these lessons from Luke 9 through 19 leading up to the triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. It's 10 chapters that recount Jesus' turn toward Jerusalem and his journey to the cross. It's 10 chapters of stories of his teachings, his miracles, his parables, his healings, connecting with the people and reveals what the Messiah is truly about in this world, that God is up to something. 10 chapters of compassion and mercy and forgiveness and revealing the dawning of the kingdom of God in our lives and in our world and in our hearts. But before we jump into the challenging text that I just read to you from Luke 9, I I think we need to take a, a look back. Now, every Lenten season has a Sunday before it, of course, and that Sunday through the lectionary is called Transfiguration Sunday. And I checked, and I, I checked on this, and you, your, um, the pastor who preached last week did preach from the Mark account of the Transfiguration. So you've got, you've got a warm up, okay? You're, you're ready, okay? You're ready. Now, I want to take you back to the Transfiguration moment in Luke because Mark is the, is the first gospel written and then Matthew and Luke kind of take a lot from Mark and both Matthew and Luke both take the Transfiguration story but they also give them each a little wrinkle and I want to share with you in particular what's happening in Luke. This is in Luke, a little earlier in Luke, Luke 9, 28, through 36, but I'm not going to read all of it, just the first uh, th- three chapter, of th- three verses uh, of the transfiguration in Luke. It said this, Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went on a, up on a mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking with him. And they appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now there are two particular details about this Luke account that's a wrinkle from Mark, and I I just want to look at it real quick. The two critical There are two critical characters here that show up besides the disciples and, of course, Jesus. That's Moses and Elijah. Moses is, kind of represents the law, right? The law was given to Moses on a mountaintop, right? And we have Elijah who is considered the greatest of the prophets. We have the law and the prophets discussing things the representatives of the law and the prophets discussing things, discussing this departure with Jesus on this mountain. So I think the first thing, really quick, is that there is a priority of prayer here, right? They, Jesus says, we're going up to the mountain, we're going to pray. And then he starts praying, and then, uh, then some amazing things start to happen, Right? He is on the mountain praying. This is actually a theme throughout Luke that you will find. That Jesus prays more in Luke than anywhere else. And it is a very profound theme in Luke's gospel. It's also linking prayer to Jesus, reminding us how important it is to him and how important it should be to us. Someone once described prayer this way. This is how you should pray. You talk to God, but you keep it simple and and keep it sincere, and keep it short. (laughs) Luke is reminding us that um, it's very important to pray. It's important in this story. As the eyes of the disciples begin to see, as they finally begin to understand who Jesus is before he begins this journey to Jerusalem toward Easter, prayer is an important part of this. And it's an important part of who Jesus is on the journey and that Jesus is taking us on this journey 
We need to pray. You need to pray. You need to pray for each other. Pray for your congregation. You have an annual meeting next week. Pray. Keep your congregation at the forefront of your prayers. The second part, so, okay, so that's kind of the obvious wrinkle uh, of Luke's transfiguration is the primacy of prayer. But the second is a little more hidden. And the second part is a description that's easy to overlook. In verse 31, they appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure. All right, so what's happening here? This word departure is a translation of the word in the Greek of exudas. Exudas is, yes, you guessed it, exodus. They are talking about Jesus' exodus. Now, this is the very same word that is the second book of the Bible, meaning the, it means the road out. It, it means that, um, you know, a way out. It, it's a word that, that could just mean you go that way. Have your exodus. But I think Luke is hitting on something with his intentionally using this word with Jesus' conversation with Moses and Elijah because I don't think it's a coincidence. Because Moses, in particular, and Jesus discussing an exodus, there's a connection there, my friends. There's a connection. The sage of the Israelites' journey from nomadic tribes, saved in Egypt, right? They all ran to Egypt. There was a famine. They ran to Egypt. And Joseph, who was the right hand of Pharaoh, there's that whole story at the end of Genesis, and he saves the, his brothers, and the tribes of Israel are saved, and they stay in the land of Israel. And they are saved in, and they are saved in the land of Egypt. But then what happens? They become slaves in the land of Egypt. And life unfolds. And things happen in this biblical story. And it's an indispensable part of our story as well. Right? It says at the beginning of uh, Exodus, now a new king of Egypt had arose who did not know Joseph. Okay? So, uh-oh, they lost the connection. They didn't remember Joseph anymore and how he had helped the people. And so now these folks are now expendable and they are now a part of a commodity. So what happens? It happens in our story as well. You see that in Exodus, you see Exodus everywhere. We see it today. We see it wherever you consume your news, television shows, in the Old Testament, New Testament, Facebook, social media. Go ahead, look. You will find Pharaoh alive and well in our world. You see, Pharaoh lives in fear. Pharaoh lives in anxiety. He has dreams of acquiring more, but also has nightmares of scarcity. And so Pharaoh accumulates to himself wealth, land, food, people he can take advantage of until he has a monopoly on everything. And what the biblical story teaches us is that if you have a monopoly on something and live in constant fear, you will end up inevitably in violence. It happens over and over in our history. And so the slaves are treated violently in order to enhance Pharaoh's monopoly. But the book of Exodus is not written by Pharaoh. The book of Exodus is written by those underneath, by the people who are oppressed. And we always need to hear the voices from below. We need to hear the voices of the people from below today. We need to hear the voices of the people of Gaza. We need to hear the people, the voices of the people in the Ukraine right now who are very desperate. And you see, Pharaoh is afraid. Pharaoh is afraid of his slaves, as all masters are afraid of their slaves. And 
So he institutes a new law, right? In response to there being too many of them, as Exodus tells us. And so if a male child is born for a certain age, he is put to death. And then, of course, we know that we get the story of Shifra and Pua, the two midwives who refuse the order, who make up a story like these, these, uh, these women, uh, these Israelite women are too strong in, in childbirth. They have the babies before we can show up, right? Because they've been commissioned to kill these children. And they, they make us a, a, a social justice stand to say, no, we will not do it. But they do it cleverly and wisely. And we have their names for eternity, right? That we know their names. They have been honored in the book of Exodus. But it's also interesting that in Pharaoh, in that story, we don't have Pharaoh's name. But I don't think it really matters that much because there are just so many Pharaohs and they're all just alike. So, the Exodus story of the Old Testament is encountered in the New. Because in the Exodus is where God sets a covenant people to go free. Jesus is about to embark on that journey in his ministry to set his people free. The Exodus is more about God liberating God's people. It's a story about justice. It's a story about God setting these people free, but also about God teaching them how to live free if they can. It's a story of how to live by faith. It's a story that stands in stark contrast to Pharaoh, whose life is categorized by anxiety, and God tells them, you know, you are more than what you produce. You are more than what you do eight hours a day or more. You're more valuable than that. Our society sees value in in our work, in the consumption. Jesus says, you have inherent value. You have the image of God. And so guess what? We need to rest. We need a Sabbath. We need a time to take a breath, right? It's a gift to us when we realize this. And so it takes faith and trust in God who has created us and says to us that we are more than just what we do every week. So, in today's text, so that's kind of the background. Uh, I'm going to get there, I'm going to get there. So in today's text, Jesus sets his face to Jerusalem. All right. So there's two parts of the story. He goes to the Samaritan village and they reject him and then he goes on his journey and he starts walking towards Jerusalem and he has three different encounters. So the first part, the Samaritans, they reject him. It says, why? Because he was set his mind on Jerusalem. Now do you know who the Samaritans are? The Samaritans are a people who live nor- in the northern part of, of what would have been Israel or kind of this Assyria uh, was uh, uh, Syria, parts of Lebanon. It was, a, it was they were kind of like, there was a king, northern kingdom that had been taken by the Assyrians back, you know, 700 years before this all happened. And they had a lot of things in common, but they didn't share everything in common. And it was some of the tribes of Israel were there. And they, that's what happens sometimes when we have a lot of, things in common with people, those are the people that we have the most arguments with, it seems like. So, so he goes into the Samaritans and it becomes political because he's like, you know, I got to go to Jerusalem. I've got to go there and I have work to do in that direction. And he is rejected because of that political stance that he takes. That's what happens. Well, guess what? Then the response of the disciples, or some of the disciples, was to overreact. We don't ever do that, do we? We never overreact. So what do they do? But yet, yeah, lest we uh, want to condemn these uh, uh, disciples too quickly, they said, Jesus, do you, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and consume them? 
Can you just imagine what Jesus is thinking? How long have you been with me? What's going on? It just says quickly, and he rebuked them. He rebuked them. I had a Greek professor uh, who made a big deal about this word, the rebuke there in uh, Luke. It's found a lot in the Gospels, especially Mark's Gospel. He likes this word. And outside of the New Testament, uh, one of the common ways, a very common way this particular word for rebuke is used is to mean to muzzle a dog, okay? So he's basically saying, shut up. Enough. Close your yap, right? He's muzzling the dog of the disciples. No. No. What are you talking about? So that's the first part. And this is difficult. We'll, we'll, we'll touch on this later. Uh, like, not today, but down the road. But down the road of this journey we're taking. All right. So, so basically Jesus muzzles them like a dog. They're barking too much. They're just barking. They don't even know what they're saying. Enough. They had a lot of anger. We don't have any of that, do we? We don't overreact. We don't have anger in our society. See, this stuff is pulled from the headlines, folks. It's as true then as it is today. The journey of Jesus was never a search and destroy mission. It was a seek and save venture. We need to see this. We need to see it today. The disciples have a problem right now to seeing who Jesus truly is. They haven't quite gotten it. They haven't quite integrated it into themselves. They haven't quite grasped it. They haven't taken it into their lives. It's going to come later. The whole love your neighbor as yourself thing, the whole love your enemies thing, how to respond to people who disagree with you and treat you the wrong ways. These are challenging things. And they're cha as challenging for us as it was for those disciples. But it's a good lesson for them. And it's a good lesson for us this morning. Because we live in a world that may not respond well to you to your beliefs, to your perspective, to your relationship with Jesus. Is the response that we are to have anger, vindication, calling down fire from heaven? Unfortunately, too many Christians are doing this. I heard a story one time a pastor told. He was doing an interim ministry in a church and and they were calling a meeting to discuss that there was, a, there was something happening in their neighborhood and the whole church wanted to, to meet and discuss it. So he goes to the meeting and finds out that the, the land right next to the church had been purchased. The church had been trying to purchase it, but it had been sold to a guy who was going to build a gas station. And they were very upset. And one lady stands up and she said, well, I just pray that it explodes. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't just happen here. It's not just the disciples. Calling fire down from heaven is something that Christians do today. All right, so the next passage has three strange, if not hard, sayings. And I want to unpack them for you. You've probably heard these before. The first is someone declares, I will follow you wherever you go. Can't you just hear their enthusiasm? They're ready. They're gun ho They're ready. They're fired up. And Jesus' response, he's like, okay, but guess what? Foxes have holes. Birds have the nest of the air. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I think he's saying, he's jumping a little cold water on their enthusiasm, isn't he? He's saying, are you sure? Are you sure? Because this is going to be hard. 
See, that's a big, that's a big misnomer. People find Christ, they recommit their lives to Jesus, and then, you know, they're, they're on fire. They're on fire. That's, that's good. But then reality hits. And we need to realize that when we make a conscious decision, intentional decision to follow Jesus, that doesn't mean that your life is going to get easier. It doesn't. And oftentimes it will get harder. Jesus is tempering their enthusiasm and saying, hey, this is going to be hard. But we're left, it's open-ended. Maybe they joined, maybe they didn't. That's an interesting response. You know, it's not a, if Jesus had a social media account today, I don't think that's what a social influencer would do, right? They're not going to try to stamp down the people who want to show enthusiasm. No, you build those people up, right? No, he's, there's a commitment here. So be careful what you ask for. He's being honest. He's being up front. There's going to be a lot of roughing it because my followers, this follower may not know what's about to happen. The editor of Orbis Press, it's up in uh, Marignol, New York, uh, is, said this. It's, it's a popular uh, Christian press. A popular metaphor for the people of God is the one on pilgrimage, right? But I think a more accurate idea would be the people of God as nomads. Pilgrims know where this journey is headed. Nomads are called to go by uncertain paths to a place that shall be made holy at some indefinite time by something God shall say or do. And there's no guide, just a pillar of fire at night and a column of clouds by day, sounds and symbols of the Holy Spirit. We're spiritual nomads. We're walking this journey together. Doesn't, it doesn't mean God doesn't know where we're going, but we may not know, right? When Jesus is calling the first disciples in John, they're like, where are you going? His response, come and see. It may be different and more difficult than you imagined. This is serious. So now the next, two, the next two encounters seem even tougher. Verse 59 to 60, Jesus says to someone, follow me. He's actually, all right, follow me. He's, he's ready for this person. And the person makes what seems like a reasonable uh, request. Lord, first let me go bury my father. Now, I think we can all say, you know what? That's kind of reasonable. But what's Jesus say? Jesus tells them, let the dead bury the dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. What is going on here? At a minimum, it seems insensitive. Where's the compassion, Jesus? But here's the thing. The person's father probably hadn't unexpectedly died. Now stay with me. If he had, if his father was actually dead, then he wouldn't even be here talking to Jesus. He would not even, he would be doing the meaningful ritual things, the elaborate rituals concerning the burial of family members. What was most probably happening here was that the person is anticipating his father is going to die. Then he would need to attend to the elaborate rituals and obligations and secure his inheritance of other things. Then, after that, he will join with Jesus. So Jesus is saying, let the dead bury the dead. He is telling him, let those who are preoccupied with satisfying the expectations of this world handle it. 
the expectations of this world, the expectations of our culture, of family, of occupations, of nationality, of even our religion. It is these, quote unquote, dead people who are unresponsive to the compelling presence of the kingdom of God and the person of Jesus. This is radical, folks. In effect, what is he calling them? Zombies? Are they living dead? Hmm. Here we have a powerful message. And now, the third conversation on the road. It's also perplexing. Someone is ready to follow him as long as he can go tell his family goodbye. Okay, now this is a little less. He's just asking to say, can I just tell my family goodbye? Another seemingly understandable request. Then Jesus hits him with a seemingly cryptic response. No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom. What's going on here? Hmm. Well, here's where the first century Jewish readers would have, are better equipped to know this. They have an advantage over us. They know what Jesus is doing. In 1 Kings 19, there's a story about Elijah. Remember Elijah? Trans the transfiguration. Elijah, he's selecting his apprentice, who is Elisha, who will take up the prophetic mantle of Elijah. So in the text, Elijah goes up to Elijah while he was plowing a field and selects him. Then Elijah asks to go kiss his father and mother before he leaves with Elijah. And Elijah makes him the request. Elijah says, yeah, you can go. Do that. Tell your parents goodbye. And then come with me. Jesus, understand what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying... He is elevating himself above Elijah. He is saying that the job is so urgent that even what Elijah offered Elisha is not what we can do. I am not granting you that. We've got to go. Time is of the essence. And it's radical what he's saying. So my friends, we have departed on the journey. We have departed on the journey with Jesus on this departure. We are departing from a world which we think we know, and we are entering into a new beginning, a new kingdom that is dawning in our world. Let us pray. Oh, holy God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for these departures. We thank you for these radical words. I pray that you will continue to... Uh, Feed us on this journey through the, the Gospel of Luke as we approach the, our, our Holy Week, your Holy Week, a week in which we celebrate, we shed tears. But all along the journey, help us to be prayerful and mindful of the ways in which you depart from the ways of our world. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, my friends. Let us sing our next hymn, hymn 718, Take Up Your Cross, the State of the Dead. During this hymn, we will collect a prayer request, those those pink slips in front. If you want to fill one of those out, you can have to be sure to please do so this time. Thank you.
Wow, feels a little heavy. We got prayers. It's a praying church. That's good. All right, my friends. Uh, you're, you're getting this as soon as I get them. For the family of Joyce uh, Lavery, is that right? Uh, who passed over, who passed. Uh, and we pray for her. Uh, we pray for her husband. Mom and child uh, needs money. Lord, uh, please help soon. Uh, beloved mother, uh, beloved mother passed yesterday from cancer. I wish her peace and comfort. I will miss her dearly. Mm. A friend facing heart surgery. Uh, let's see, uh, healing my mother's left arm and left leg. Uh, application for a home loan to be approved. Apartment in White Plains, uh, it's affordable. My sister-in-law, uh, Rose Ann Valencia, battling cancer. Hmm. Blessings and prayers for healing and comfort. To Roseanne and her family, prayers for my family in London, blessings for all my friends and their families, prayers uh, for Norma and our church and world peace, for one, uh, for one who has blood cancer and for a father who has surgery to remove uh, cancer from his ear, for hope for those who are sick. Um, and for healing. Happy and healthy family, uh, pray for peace uh, among the nations, uh, help to a senior, the end to war, patience, blessed, uh, for blessed Lent season, safety and safe travels, school work, a great um, uh, winter break, a friend who is having brain surgery tomorrow. World peace for all people. Pray for the sick and suffering along with my well-being. Let us take these prayers to the Lord and those which we also carry but are silent this day. Oh, holy God, we thank you for these prayers that have been lifted up to you. We offer them all to you, heartfelt, heavy on our souls. We just ask for your presence. You know all these situations for your guidance, for your direction in all of these situations that have been read. We lift up those that are on our hearts and minds this, this morning that have not been read, but yet still wear heavy on our hearts. We pray now that you will bring your peace, not only in our world, but in our own hearts and in our relationships and lives. But most importantly, this morning, we give gratitude for you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, into this world. Who taught us to pray, pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day as we have and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We do have a few announcements uh, in the life of the church. First one being the annual meeting, the call for which I will uh, read. It's also printed on the separate sheet of announcements. The annual meeting of the White Plains Presbyterian Church will be held in person in the sanctuary on Sunday, February 25th, immediately after the worship service at 11.15 a.m. Everyone is welcome to attend. All active members are eligible to vote. The meeting is called for the following purposes to have the meetings of the congregation and the corporation of the WPPC run concurrently, 
to authorize the session to, elect, to select auditors for 2023 as necessary, to elect elders to the class of 2025, to elect elders for the class of 2026, to elect elders for the class of 2027, to elect deacons for the class of 2025, to elect deacons for the class of 2026, to elect deacons for the class of 2027, to receive the end of the year 2023 financial report from the treasurer, to present the 2024 budget as approved by the session, to receive the reports for the committees and boards of the church, to authorize session to approve the minutes of the annual congregational meeting February 25th, 2024, and the Pastoral Search Committee update on the status. So that'll be next week. Now let us continue to our offering. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. Invite the ushers to come forward at this time to collect as we continue the worship of God with our tithes and offerings. gifts are from you. We thank you for these gifts that have been graciously and sacrificially given. We thank you for uh, the life of this church and for the nourishment that will come from these gifts. We pray for your blessings upon them and that your work will continue. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, my friends. We now come to our sending hymn, hymn 432, How Clear is our vocation, Lord. Let us remain standing and sing.
friends, I want to make a promise to you. I preached as long as I'm going to preach over Lent, okay? I preached a long time today. I apologize. But I felt like I needed to get, get a lot of information to you, and, and I hope that it was meaningful to you. But I know we went long, so thank you for staying with us. I didn't see a mass exodus, so. But hey, I did preach about the exodus, so hey, he preached about exodus. I can leave, right? Well, anyway. All right. Well, thank you. It's good to, to, to share this time with you. Thank you for coming. Let us close in prayer. Well, holy God, we just thank you for this time. We ask now that you will take us into this Lenten season, this lengthening of days with your light and hope in our hearts. Amen.